From Hong Kong, Chicago, and the city of Stoke-on-Trent, this is the Classic Lenses Podcast. Hello, and welcome to episode 100. My name is Simon Forster, and I'm joined by Johnny Sisson and Perry G. Hello, Johnny. Hello. And hello, Perry. Hello. We've hit a milestone today. This is our 100th show. Um, and it's a double milestone as well, because this also means this is our second anniversary of making the show. So, um, yeah, pretty much of a big deal, that really, I think. Um, now, I've, I've had, I did have a few things to say, but I was uh, invited on to Back in Paper. Uh, that's the, uh, the Sunday 16 uh, email show, if you like. And I said quite a bit about this episode 100 and some of the uh, the ups and downs that we've had in our uh, last last two years so I, I don't really want to repeat myself there because it got a little bit difficult at times but um, perhaps Johnny might want to have a few words about uh, our show 100 and our time together oh my gosh um, uh, yeah I mean it's I, it, it's it's hard to believe it's it's been a hundred. I, what else is, of course I'm going to say that like an idiot, but you know, I, it, it is, it's, it's really kind of amazing that, uh, I think back to when we started this and, and I can't believe we're still doing it, but it, I'm, I'm really glad we are. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we get to do this every week. And, um, it's just still funny to me that it was somewhat like on a whim, and Simon kind of pushed and pushed on it a little bit, and we all talked about it. And we finally did it, and then it, it's just not stopped since then, which is hard to believe. Um, and, and obviously, thinking back to when you know we all started, it was it was Simon and Carl and myself, and and now Perry's in, and it's just been we've we've actually you know we've done a lot. We've we've it's we've done a lot of stuff, a hundred episodes. So it's yeah, it's it's very exciting and. We're glad that you people actually that you people actually listen to this, uh, and I guess today you people are actually going to watch this. So uh, thanks, thanks for that as well. But yeah, thanks for sticking in with us and and sharing a little bit of our lives with us. We appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And as Johnny has said, there, um, I mean, there are going to be people listening in their on their podcasting software, or how, however they normally uh, get to hear the show. But as Johnny just said there. Uh, this show is on YouTube as as you know, our shows have been on YouTube now for I don't know the past 10 weeks or so but they're just literally uh, the, yeah. the audio with a with a photograph and that's it right um, <laughs> um, whereas we've we've met, we've pushed things out a little bit um, we've not pushed things too far because nobody really wants to see our, our faces um, okay. so uh, we've we've got something a pretty interesting lined up and if you are listening to this in your car or wherever it is then it's going to be very descriptive and there's going to be oh and have a look at this and oh i see what you mean now without us actually uh, explaining what it is we're even looking at and can it can it has anybody ever done like sports play by play before perry have you done that maybe perry could do sports play by play like <laughs> coming out the window now is the biotar i don't know i mean so it'd probably perry perry you seem like you'd be good at something like that i don't know i could try but i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if i'd be using the right vocabulary <laughs> well as i say those those if you're if you're listening to this as purely audio um it's not going to be optimal for you this week um but you will be able to go back and you know stop listening now and go to your computer or go to your phone or however you you do things on youtube because we have a youtube channel and you just do a search for classic lenses podcast and you'll find our youtube channel and this is episode 100 and um, there it's going to be worth the effort to actually just sit down and watch the show rather than uh, do whatever you're doing with your headphones doing the washing up hoovering up or whatever it is that uh, that you normally do when you when you listen to the show so uh, head over to uh, youtube and do a search for our channel Channel, which is photography no it's not photography of classic lenses that's the one of our facebook groups it's the classic lenses podcast um that's that's our channel um right so, you know you yeah. you say that but the sunny 16 podcast as we know has very very popular episodes where they spend hours and hours just describing <laughs> photographs so <laughs> it can be done true. and so enjoy what it we in sh- purely yeah, audio format yeah what we should have done is had one of those sunny 16 people on to do descriptions of what's on the screen for people who are listening 
<laughs> well, dude, you'd have to do it in like a tennis or a golf announcer voice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And now he moves his mouse. <laughs> exactly. <and clicks. laughs> um, well, there is some irony on that. When I, because like I say I, I did help. I helped uh, Graham out last night uh, for the show that's coming out later today. I think um, for backing paper for Sunday Sixteen. And part of that was actually talking about photographs for their latest cheap shop challenge. So, oh my god! So there, there was there was some karma there that uh, that hit me hit me in the bum uh, on that. Uh, so uh, yeah, if you want to if you want to listen to oh, that's the other part. If you really want to listen to me struggle to read things, because it's yeah, you know, it's an email show. Uh, yeah, that's that's basically what that show is about. And the irony is that the first email that that uh, Graham had uh, lined up for the show, because I said that I'm not going to do the the big emails. Uh, I just I'll do the one line as well, there weren't any. Um, it says, "Oh, don't worry, uh, you can do the first one." And the first one was one that I wrote, and I, could, <laughs> I, I could not read my own email, oh, so, uh, my God. which is pretty shocking. But there you go. So uh, tune in, tune into my embarrassment. Um, if you want, um, <laughs> that'll be coming out later today, I think. So, uh, but uh, now it was a blast doing it with with Greg. Really enjoyed that, and uh, and as I say, I do talk a little bit about episode one hundred and. Uh, uh, a little retrospective of where where we've come um, on that. So there we go. Now, um, keen listeners uh, would have heard an extra voice um, uh, just then, and that's because uh, we have a returning guest. And uh, so returning from episode 64, which was Carl, Carl Haven's last show with us, uh, is Jason Lane. Uh, hello, Jason. Hey, guys. Hey, Simon. How's it going? It's, it's going good, and it's... It's fantastic to have you back on. I mean, the the feedback we actually had from from the show that you were on last time was was in, incredible, and and certainly uh, my takeaway, uh, I think I probably said it on the show, is uh, everything we thought we knew about lenses was wrong. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's yeah, because you're you are a a designer of lenses and. You know, you, you, admittedly, you're, you're not the largest user of lenses. I mean, that's that's where uh, Johnny Perry and I are, are very, very much focused yes. upon. Yeah. And the, the, it's it's almost like there's a there's a different language there. But there are so many assumptions that that users like ourselves make when we talk about different lenses and different designs. And you royally put us straight um, in <laughs> episode sixty four. Well, it's it. I I gotta tell you, it's an honor to uh, be back here, especially for such a such a uh, you know landmark uh, episode so I, I i'm really happy to be back and and talk shop like this um the uh yeah uh the the interesting comment that i wanted to make to to your point is that yes i've i've done lens design for for a couple decades and and talk a different language and i try not to to get caught up in the jargon and stuff but uh i Obviously, I'm a, a photographer myself on the side, and and am familiar with the lenses that I like to use. But but you guys, I consider the experts on, on the specifics of using the lenses. Um, so it's a good, it's a good conversation, I think, to to get, to get those worlds messed up, messed up, you know, from my design perspective and from your user perspective. I think that's yeah. great. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things that we talked about on that show was what happened before we started the show, uh, which was absolutely one oh, of the highlights yeah. of last year for us. And and that was you spent a little bit of time doing a screen share of the software that you use. Yeah. And and it was remarkable. And it was just it was at the time where I thinking if only people could actually see uh, this piece of software and you talking it through and you know <laughs> talking about the different differences in different lenses and so on, wouldn't that make a great show? Well, that's pretty much what we're, we're going to uh, try and emulate uh, today. So um, those people on YouTube have been just seeing a, a, just a rather generic uh, Classic Lenses podcast screen. But I'm very, very shortly, I'm going to click on another button and you're going to see uh, Jason's, um, Jason's software. Um, so I think bef before we go into explaining that software, at least, I think it's probably yeah. worth just giving a very, very brief uh, recap about yourself. And uh, because you do things other than, uh, I mean, just lens design, uh, you do other things as well. Um, so uh, for those people that haven't come across you before, if you can just give us a little rundown uh, of what you're about, and then we'll let you start talking about your software and a, and a bit of a history lesson on lenses. 
Sure, absolutely. So, hi, I'm Jason Lane. Uh, I live in New Hampshire in the United States. Uh, I've been a lens designer. Well, lens designing is my profession. I've been doing it for for 20 years, except for uh, a, a, a break a couple uh, years ago to get into other things. Um, interestingly, uh, talking to you on the podcast last time for ex- episode 64 actually made me realize how much I had missed it. And so I, I've i since gone back to a, a company that I worked at previously as their chief lens designer, or one of their two chief lens designers, I guess you could say, and and back at it. So uh, thank you, I guess. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, That's so it was cool. either that or go up into management and, you know, screw that. But yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it was it's good. It's it's I love doing this stuff. It's a passion of mine and um and I really enjoy it and I like to think I'm good at it, but uh that's for others to say. Um and, and uh my my primary hobby has been photography. Obviously, the tie-in is is in the optics and um apparently uh just doing photography wasn't uh, wasn't uh, complex enough. So a few years ago, I got into shooting uh, photographic dry plates, which is the uh, dry plates is a photographic process that that people used before film was invented, um, where the silver gelatin emulsion is coated onto glass plates. So I, I started making those for my own use. I did that for three years or so. And then sort of spontaneously started selling those online. And that actually happened uh, just a little over two years ago. So I'm also celebrating a two-year anniversary with with uh, the founding of Pictoria Graphica. So I sell nice. JLA dry plates throughout the world. Um, and uh, that that's going really, really well. So um, I'm in the midst of uh, a successful Kickstarter campaign for new dry plate holders. Um, those are being, the parts are being manufactured and, and we'll get those out to people. Um, so a lot of interesting stuff going on. Yeah. And, and somewhere in there, I, I sleep a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So that's, that's the gist of it. I don't work in the consumer photographic world. I work in aerospace and defense and, and like, um, Simon has mentioned, uh, I do have a design that's going up on the space station, which is cool. Um, so, so a lot of interesting stuff and I definitely see optics from a design world or from a design perspective, I guess you could say. Excellent. Okay. Well, uh, I think people are, are up to date, so, uh, I'll let you get on with it. I think you've, you've done similar kind of talks before, so I'll, uh, let you Tell us a little bit more about the history of lenses and things that you, you're going to going to cover. Oh yeah, so uh, I guess uh, so. Is can can you see my screen? Is it up? Yep, it's up now. Okay, so the the first thing I'm going to do is is uh, I'm, I'm sure the first question your the listeners have is what the hell am I looking at? Um, well, this is this is ZMAX um, or Optic Studio uh, professional uh, lens design software. So this is one of the the premier tools out in the world for designing optics in the modern modern era. Um, it's more than just pretty pictures and a bunch of numbers, which may or may not mean anything. This is a physics-driven engine, so the 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 values that go into um, this lens data spreadsheet are are used to simulate uh, how light is traced through the lens, and there's a lot of parameters and stuff. Uh, that have to be set up to to make a proper lens design, um, and I'll try to navigate. I'll try to get through these and, and sort of show you what you're looking at before we start digging into actual uh, lenses and stuff and the history of of lens design. So um, the first thing that I'm going to show you, uh, and hopefully you can see my mouse. Yep, we've got it. It's, it's, uh, it comes across as a little bit jerky, but you can follow it. Yeah, mm-hmm. okay. Um I was going to make like a cool sort of mouse icon thing that was like a koala bear or something like that, but I you know, it's easier said than done. Uh so this there's four windows, four main windows here that you see 
uh, that's providing me information on on this lens design, which is a uh, what is this? This is a uh, the equivalent of a uh, Olympus Wico fifty f one point four. It's not the actual prescription. And, and something I was telling the guys before the show was that um, optical prescriptions are typically considered corporate proprietary information because it's 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 similar to the formula for Coca Cola or or the the C code for for Microsoft Windows or something like that. That's their that's their bread and butter. So uh, prescriptions are usually closely guarded secrets, and sometimes they'll be patent protected. And when when the prescriptions make it out into the patents, um, designers like to cha- make make subtle changes that that keep uh, other designers from in in other companies from copying their uh, prescription. So, but this is uh, pretty close to what. Even that, you know, uh, as a lens designer, I can I can look at a lens design and and understand the performance and sort of back out what the prescription is. And in fact, this is a double Gauss design out of the patent literature, which has made its way into databases that designers use. And I can sort of replicate what what the Olympus, the fifty millimeter f one four looks like. So, anyways, um, first the important thing is the parameters for the prescription. Uh, in this lens data spreadsheet, uh, let me briefly point out. So the the data is is uh, presented in a in a spreadsheet form, uh, for, uh, surface to surface. So you can imagine that this line line zero is where the object is. That's that's a, a standard convention, uh, which is it's out at infinity. So this this tells me that the lens is currently uh, imaging a, a, a scene out at infinity or very, very far away, to use the technical term. Um, <laughs> the the second line here, line one, is colored blue because it's a it's the first surface of a of a glass material or or a, a non air object, um, and it's the first surface of the lens. And over here in the in the cutaway of the lens, you'll see see that surface highlighted as I select different ones, different surfaces get highlighted. So the radius, this is the radius of curvature. So it it's uh, how curved the surface is. This thickness is the center thickness. It's always the center thickness of the lens by convention. And this is the glass material. And if I uh, I can bring up the, the, for TAF one, it's uh, here's the index and the dispersion, the Abbey number. Um, and then you have the, they call it the semi diameter, but it's, it's the, it's the physical radius. Obviously they don't call it radius to avoid confusion with this, but it's the semi diameter. So it's the distance from the center of the lens to the edge of the glass, uh, as, as I'm highlighting my mouse here, uh, there's this chip zone. I don't use that. Screw that. Oh crap. I did something wrong. <laughs> Hold on. Um, there's, uh, Oh, I see what I did. Um, so there's uh, this chip zone, which I don't use. I'm going to try to hide that. There's a mechanical semi diameter. So the difference between the clear semi diameters and the mechanical, the clear is the clear aperture. So the the area on the surface of the lens that I'm worried about light getting through the mechanical semi diameter as you can see is is uh is two millimeters wider a millimeter on each side um since lenses are always uh turned into real physical objects you have to accommodate mechanical mounting in a barrel and stuff and so a millimeter around the radius is 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 a pretty good starting point for for physical mounting dimensions uh, the conic constant as a zero, that means that that's a spherical surface. If I change that, uh, this is a hyperboloid, hyperboloidal surface, so an A-sphere. And then here's a coefficient of expansion. This is uh, this simulates at a first order uh, putting the lens into a, a, into a barrel. Uh, if I wanted to simulate over temperature, what would happen? Uh, if I put it in an aluminum barrel, I put a 
put the value for aluminum in there. Um, so this is more than just prescriptions that this is more than just the typical prescription formulas that you may see out on the internet because is this is simulating a real physical object it, it has to because people depend on this to design real real lenses so um, way more information than I'm sure most folks have probably seen but this is par for the course for me so uh, so that's and that's the that's the first line in this prescription. So um, the second one, uh, the rate, this is the radius of curvature for this uh, second surface. If you see a positive number here, that means that the, uh, that the lens is the center of the radius curvature is to the right. If you see a negative value, then it's to the left. And that's, that's by convention. So, um, for optical engineers and lens designers, light always comes from the left and goes to the right, never the other way. So you always have to be shooting to the left when you take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, uh, this value here is the center thickness in air. So there's a, there's a little air gap in there that's a quarter millimeter. Oh, um, and yeah, the, I should mention that the units are all in metric. So even here in the U.S., we, as a lens designer, we've all switched over to the metric system. Um, so you're you're welcome, I guess. I don't know. Uh, so these two, these two surfaces here, describe uh, is what I need to describe this first lens, and then the the air gap that comes after it. So line three is has similar information for the second lens. Um, and then the the second surface and the air gap behind it. Um, lens surface five is the first surface for this lens, so on, so forth. Uh, right here, you see this word, the stop. That's where the aperture stop is, and it's defined by these this little uh, little icon graphic here. Um, so that defines the aperture stop for the lens. Um, so it is, is, no... is that the point where the is it a nodal point or something where the where the light crosses over as well? Is that in the same place? That's the that's the physical stop. So in your camera lens, that's where the iris is located. Yeah, but I'm just yeah. wondering if that if that's actually located in a specific place for a specific reason. It it is definitely so. The position of the stop in a in a lens definitely impacts the aberration correction. Um, there's a couple of things that that. Uh, that dictate where that should be. For one, this is a double gauss form of design, which relies heavily on on lens symmetry. And by symmetry, I mean it's the lenses up front are similar to the lenses behind the stop, so it's it's located at the center of the lens. And then the other thing, you know, aside from tweaking these air gaps, which position it between the two lenses for aberration correction, I also have to make sure that the physical iris will clear mm. the glass in between. So mm. um, you could see that if it, uh, uh, let me see if I can do this. If I put the aperture, the iris here, even though from a, from a computer software being dumb and not knowing the right answer, obviously you wouldn't want to put an iris here, even though technically it's, it's okay. Um, because you wouldn't be able to put a mechanical iris in there because this lens is in the way, right? So, so what but to, si it? to Simon's question, the position of the iris doesn't have to correspond with the uh, what he calls the nodal point, right? Which is, Simon, are uh, you envisioning sort of where the rays flip? Yes. Uh, yeah, that that's actually where it is too. So, uh, oh, okay. You, you sound surprised I might have got something right there, Perry. No, no, no. I, I find that interesting because, you know, the positioning of the iris, um, I'm curious just sort of what difference that makes because the Zeiss Tessar and the Leica Elmar, um, the, the 53.5s at least, have pretty much the, a very similar optical design, but Leica always likes to say, oh, we, we didn't copy the Tessar because we put the iris in a different place. Uh, yeah, I would say something like that too. 
<laughs> so so to Simon's point um where so I'm going to I'm going to check this marginal and chief only. So these these two rays, the marginal ray sort of defines the clear aperture and the chief ray is is the ray that goes through the center of the iris and so you can see that it sort of flips here. So um these two things are important. One is this defines the the physical aperture, at least on axis, for the for the lens. Um, the chief ray is 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 on the uh, towards the bottom here before before it hits the aperture and then it flips over to the top side, and so uh, the what. The, the result of that is that the the aberrations that are calculated, like if you went, if you dug down and, and did the calculations for the aberrations that depend on the the chief ray position, you'd see that on this side, some of them would have negative values. On this side, some would have positive values. And so for a design, for a symmetrical design like this, designers take advantage of that, flip in the sign to uh, cancel out uh, what we call the odd aberration, so like distortion, coma, um, and lateral color. So, so those are dependent on the chief ray height. So, if the height is negative, so by convention, positive is up and and uh, negative is down. So, if the those aberrations are negative and positive in the design, you can you can see that they cancel out. And I think I could show that at least for distortion. Well, you guys know. So, in a double Gauss distortion is usually very well controlled um mm -hmm. actually uh, there, was, there was something you said earlier as well about symmetrical design and double yes. gauss being symmetrical uh, but you didn't yes. say in absolute terms and and certainly this lens that we're looking at at the moment is a seven a seven element lens with and yeah. um you know if you there, there is it's not it's not truly symmetrical in the ge uh, geometric sense uh, but it's yeah, symmetry. so symmetrical it's really look, isn't it? Right. So, so symmetry means something slightly different uh, to lens designers, just like uh, uh, every other uh, profession, I guess, has their own jargon. Uh, so, so when I talk about symmetry, I'm talking about how the the design um, is symmetrical if you if your object and image distance were the same. Um, the double gauss is a symmetrical design form, but since the the object, so to speak, since you're usually looking uh, uh, taking a picture much farther away than than the distance between the 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 lens, the pupil, and and the film plane, uh, you have to, especially when you get faster, you have to sort of deviate from from ge geometrical symmetry to accommodate the aberrations. Um, so it's, but even so, as a lens designer, I would say this is symmetrical because of the way that you're taking advantage of the, the, that sign convention or the flip in the sign of the, of the aberrations to, to help cancel them out. I don't know if that is a good explanation or what, but, uh, um, it's, uh, I guess it talks about the. I guess what I'm trying to say is the way you correct the aberrations uh, for the for the group in front of the stop versus behind the stop are very similar, and so so that's that's why I say that this is a symmetrical design. Yeah, no, I I, I I I do get where you're coming from, and and this is also one of those areas when we talk about other formulations like Tessars and such, because back in episode 64 we we talked we pre, in previous shows we've been uh, bad mouthing uh, Zeiss mainly Johnny bad mouthing Zeiss actually about what a, what a sonar is for instance and uh, how could it be a sonar with like 12 elements and and, and we're all laughing and find it all very funny and and, and so on and then you came along and said well it is it is a sonar because it follows conventions or or something yeah. on those lines so it, it's it's yeah. You you can't look at these things in absolute terms, can you? It's it's more about, as you say, the the, the, the overall right. pattern, if you like, and how, about how they actually resolve particular problems. Then that would therefore make it consistent with a with a, a simpler design. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And 
you know, the, the file may, may say Zico, Zico? I never figured out how to pronounce that. 51.4. <laughs> but really, I see, in my mind, I say I see double Goss because that's the design family that it comes from. And and by design family, I, I think, as I mentioned on the last show, uh, designs in, in the same family sort of correct aberrations in a similar manner um, compared to like, uh, so a double Goss compared to like a, a cook triplet approach their correction to aberrations in in uh different ways uh same same as uh those compared to like a petzful or a or a zoom lens or or something like that right yeah so uh so okay so that's where the stop is and then you'll see the lenses so this surface eight nine and ten uh notice there's no gap air gap between surface eight and nine. So that means that that's a doublet. So these, these butt up right next to each other and they're bonded in place. And in, uh, for my day job, if I had a double in there, if it was a fast lens, I would actually model the thickness of the cement to make sure that I accommodated the, the impact that that has, uh, for this, for this exercise, I don't really care. Just, um, well, these are, these are questions and, and, yeah, so you're talking about a cemented element. So it's two elements that are cemented together. Yeah. Um, why? Why is that? Why? Why not just make one lens do that job? And just, I assume it's it's harder to make it. But is is that? Are there good reasons for actually using two pieces of glass instead? Uh, yeah, actually, um, the reason you do that is because uh, glass types as have real physical optical properties and uh, discrete optical properties. So index of refraction and, and the dispersion, the Abbey, Abbey number um, mean real physical things and how they, they bend the light um, and, and more importantly, bend the light of different wavelengths. And since you don't, since I only have a, a fixed number of glasses in the world, you know, there's one, two, 300-ish different optical glasses, which seems like a lot um, but it's there's limits to what you can, how you can tune the index and the dispersion to get color correction down. And so, mm. if you really need to correct color, which you need to, um, because very few camera lenses look at a single wavelength, uh, you sort of have to, um, uh, I would say, uh, make your own glass type. In the way, one of the ways you do that is by making an achromat. So, um, if you worked out the calculation and stuff, you could look at this doublet as a single lens with an index of refraction and a dispersion that are different than than the values for the glass types that you use. And uh, oh. and uh, I could really get in the weeds of, of so, why that is, but so you wouldn't use um, a cemented doublet or triplet of the same type of glass. Right, that's kind of silly. Okay, gotcha. uh, I, I guess unless you wanted the the practice the bonding lenses together, but uh, yeah, so uh, an F six SF six bonded to a another SF six element, yeah, you wouldn't do that. You just combine them and and cut down the thickness. Um, but these two glass types, uh, it's a short flint and a half one. I, I'm not as familiar with Hoya's. Uh, like like a crown probably. Uh, you combine those and they have different index of refraction and different dispersions, which when combined from the from the light's perspective, the different wavelengths, um, you know, they will very very simplistically they'll they'll come to a better focus. Um, and that's sort of uh, I'll I'll be able to show that. Uh, because I wanted to give an example of sort of a lens design evolution through the 19th century from the basic landscape lenses up, up to the double Gauss. And, and I'll get into that. And so you'll see sort of examples of, of why people pretty quickly started using a chromats. I mean, Petzval did the calculations for his Petzval lens and, you know, he's got, he's got a pair of achromats in his design one one is bonded and the other one has an air gap 
this this design here uh if you imagine taking these two lenses one is is uh the crown and the other one's a flint i it i would undoubtedly guess when the designer was working this out this started off as a bonded lens as a cemented lens as he was doing the design and for reasons of aberration control he split those apart um to get a better or not better to get a different aberration correction so you'll see things like that if it looks like it could almost be glued together if you tweak these radiuses in a in a layout then chances are that that's a that's an achromat doublet that's that's air spaced so um back here uh is a couple other singlets these were undoubtedly um a, a single lens back here that the designer split for for aberration control as well um and then then the final uh distance here is the back back focus distance so the distance from the physical glass to the image plane and then finally the image plane um so that's 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 all the data that defines the lens um just on on that uh, drawing there you've got three colors of light uh, yeah. hit, hitting the let's call it the sensor for what for want of a better word at um, three different points now does what 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 is it that we're looking at there is that something specific to just show some characteristics or i mean does it to my eyes it, it looks as if like it, it focuses in three different places and uh, i'm just wondering is that something to do with chromatic aberration or is it just showing something different so these are showing yeah this is a a, a layout so it's a cutaway of the lens if you will and this is what lens designers like to look at this is our version of a pretty picture. Um, <laughs> the 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 lines going through the lens is is uh, imagine if you will light rays coming through and hitting the lens and being traced through. Um, so Zmax is doing a calculation um, of how the ray is bent at the surface, so it hits the surface at a certain height, and knowing the index between them. And the dispersion, you know, uh, it uh, it does the, the physical calculations to to trace through that. And, it, and and I'll stress that that's very accurate. It's not a back of the envelope estimate. Um, this is actual physical where it would trace through. So uh, let's see if I can show you a little bit out in front. So I'm going to add some thickness out front and adjust this. And I'll get to your question. I'm, in, in my roundabout way. Um, so you can see that the the rays, the blue rays are all coming in parallel. Um, and that simulates coming from an object that's a long ways away on axis. So zero degrees. And by zero degrees, I mean uh, relative to the optical axis, which it's not drawn oh. here, but it's imaginary dash line going through the center of the lens. And then it's tracing through and it's being focused down onto the image plane on axis. Here, down in the spot diagram, this is what a focus point of light looks like um, geometrically. So all the different wavelengths uh, and all the different, you know, if you took, uh, let's see, 50 rays scattered throughout this, the aperture, and trace them through, this is how the, it would focus down and look like um, 50 rays at each wavelength. So this is a zero degree field angle. Um, it's colored blue because I guess they like to start out with the color of blue um, by default. So blue is always on axis or usually on axis if you see Zmax layouts out on the internet. Um, the green is, is usually the second field and over here, in this column, there's some parameters for the system. And here's a field data editor, um, which is showing that the second field is 16 degrees 
So that's relative to the optical axis. So that's 16 degrees off four. Um, here's a, an image circle diagram showing where its position is. Um, you'll probably notice that it's way, it's, it's quite a bit away from um, the center and, and closer to the, to the third field angle, which is um, 23 degrees. Um, right. It's actually at the position where half of the area of the aperture is is uh, is within the circle that it would trace, and half of the area is outside. So, you, uh, because uh, the uh, the the clear aperture areas are are important for correction. <laughs> Now, with that said, when I usually when I set up field angles, I'll usually just scatter them throughout. And there's, uh, depending on the field angles you choose and how they're weighted and all that good stuff, will impact how ZMAX will run through the optimization routines and and sort of correct the different field angles relative to each other. So if I wanted really good correction on axis at the at, at the uh, you know sacrificing performance off axis and I would put more field angles or more field points here for for Zmax to look at you know towards the center um, than then out out towards the periphery if I want a really good correction at the edges I don't know why you do that but if you wanted to do that you could put a bunch out here and, and put a high weighting on there um, we'll get into that a little bit more but uh, so yeah so so the different colors represent the different field angles. And you're seeing how the rays would trace, trace through. Now, in the real world, obviously there's there's a countless number of rays going through here, but that would get pretty crowded mm -hmm. for a diagram. So we only look at. I'm looking at seven here. If I put that up to a bunch, you could kind of see. Yeah, and and that the other thing though, I'm, I'm assuming that that's showing it in a an almost stylized way because the, those those rays of light aren't aren't flipping. Uh, around a nodal point, are they? They they appear to be going in straight lines through the lens, but that isn't actually what happens. Is this it? is this is exactly what happens. So geometrically, yeah, uh, you do get a diffractive effect, um, but uh, honestly, at this level of correction, let me let me point at the spot diagram. You have sort of a scale circle here that's two hundred fifty micrometers, which is a quarter of a millimeter, which is like ten thousandths of an inch, I think. Um, if I zoom in here at the spot, there's a little circle here, which is the diffraction limit. So, uh, if you have, if if I'm working on a diffraction limited design, then I do kind of have to be aware of the fact that diffractive effects makes this not quite accurate. But um, there there are tools up here that lets me look at look at what the uh, image correction looks like. So um, can, can I just clarify something? Yeah. Because, um, Simon, when you're talking about flipping, um, you're thinking about the actual sort of stuff crisscrossing and flipping and, like, sort of turning an image upside down, right? Exactly, yeah. But, that, that, oh, but that's, yeah. Not, that's not what's happening here because if you look at, like, say, the red beam on the edge, your, your light rays on this point are coming from, like, the bottom left. But then they're being focused on the top right. Yeah, and they, that, they, the, they, I was oh, going to say yes. that makes sense. But it's, it's actually the blue lines that are, are confuse me more than the uh, the red and the green. But 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 they will. Well, it'll they be wouldn't. upside down. So yeah. Uh, well, on axis it doesn't really matter. Off axis, you kind of have to look at the combined assembly. So something at the center of your your scene that you're pointing your camera at. Well, obviously, focus at the center of your your, I say film plane, Simon, at the <laughs> center right. of the That's film fine. plane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you imagine that you're imaging an extended object, so say you're taking a picture of this, this this line, you know, which you're seeing a slice of, the top of the the bottom of the line out in the world, will be imaged at the top, and so you could see that. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, the the image yeah. is flipped, and anybody who who works with large format cameras understands that because when you look at the ground glass to focus, 
you know, the scene is upside down. Yeah. And at some point you sort of, that becomes second nature and you ignore it. And that's the same with, with me. So, so um, Simon, um, cause I, I, I think I know what Simon's asking from like a user point of view. Um, yeah. you know, the blue rays in the middle, you see how they all focus on one point. Yes. Yeah. So Simon, if you think of that as like multiple light rays coming from like the same point, um, of the thing that you're focusing on. But then if you have, like, if you're taking a picture of someone's face, you're going to have like, you know, millions of light rays coming from their eye. Right. Mm -hmm. But then if you had a different point, yeah, yeah, this is good. But if you had a different point, like right below, like on their nose, that's going to focus on a a different point, like slightly above or below. And that's where you're going to get the flipping. Yeah. But because these are a point, like a point light source or, or seven rays from the same point, like it's one spot. Yeah, but that one it, spot in reality is going to be reflecting like millions and millions of light rays from that one point, right? Yeah, it's it's definitely a discrete a discrete point that I'm looking at because I don't really need to look at more than that uh, to see what what's going on in the design. You know, I, I define my 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 specific discrete field angles so I can gain an understanding of what the design is doing uh, for image correction and stuff, but. Uh, um, but sort of in the back of my head, you know, I understand that this is basically an infinitesimal, uh, yeah, an infinite yeah. number of rays coming through this thing, uh, landing on there. Um, okay. Oh, that's cool. So, yeah, but, but as far as physical tracing through the lens, this is, this is what the rays would do. Now that said, this is still a paper design, so this is showing sort of nominal, what I call nominal performance, which is the the uh, uh, the paper performance. When if I were to produce this lens when it goes to production, uh, part of my design exercise and a, and a big part, actually, bigger than this, is looking at the tolerance tolerances of these parts so you know like anything else that that is made in the world uh with this when the drawings for these lenses would be taken to an optical shop they won't hit this number exactly 41.906415 right uh, mm-hmm. there's a tolerance associated on that and there's two 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 reasons for a tolerance so it, it may be like 41.9 plus or minus 0.1 millimeters is the tolerance that they have to hit. Uh, one is um, you want to put a tolerance on there so that they don't charge out the butt for trying to hit a number exactly because that's that's well nigh impossible. But also, well, to, it's to keep your production costs down, right? So looser tolerances means an easier to make lens. Um, so what I do once I've come up with a notional design that seems like it will meet the performance, the next thing I look at is I do a tolerance analysis. So I, I start um, uh, tweaking these these values uh, ever so slightly to see how it impacts the performance. And there's a, ZMAX has a, like most, le- all the other lens design tools has a tolerance analysis uh, uh, routine that you can go through and you can enter in different tolerances for all these parameters and run it to a, a simulation, a Monte Carlo simulation, where it will tweak the values at random within whatever sp- you specify and, and sort of generate some information that tells you how how a real world system as part of a production run will actually perform. And so... Uh, That's also going to ex- explain a, a certain amount of um, sample variation to a degree as well, isn't it? It, it entirely explains that. And, and to be honest, so I haven't played with this particular design too much. Um, I did at some point, I'll pull up one of the designs that I've, that I've done over the past few years, which has really good, almost diffraction limit performance on paper, but the, uh, the requirements, uh, at the sampling frequency, um, I don't think I have the tolerance information out but basically the requirement is half of half of what that is and you 
and you say, well, that's a big drop. This lens meets it easily, but but actually that's not true. It's it's actually pretty tough tough to meet the requirements, and it's all because the tolerances are tight and and the lenses are hard to make and align and assemble. Mm -hmm. For for a commercial lens like this, one of the one of the reasons that designs look like they do is that is that you can meet the performance. You have really nice pictures, um, not on paper, but this sort of lens, a double Gauss lens, for example, is is easy to put together and assemble with loose tolerances and still get good performance. But there is there is a unit to unit variation, um, and when I'm looking at a production, when I'm put looking at production yields, um, I usually use a sample size of at least a thousand designs if I'm producing a hundred or so. And so to really get a feel for what, what a lens can do, you have to look at, you would have to test thousands of lenses basically. So Jason, you, you may or may not be able to answer this historical question, but I can make up an answer. <laughs> so back, you know, with a lot of these vintage lenses that we like to mm -hmm. play with, Yes. Back when they were cut and polished um, by hand and not by you know automated machines, how on earth would they have stayed close to within these really tight tolerances? So, so nowadays, there is a lot of labor involved still in producing lenses. Um, there's a there's an operator that's running the uh, lens polishing machine, or at least keeping an eye on it and stuff. So it's still still a very hands-on process. Um, yeah, not so much as a hundred years ago, but back then um, they used a lot of the same sort of basic tools that are used in a shop today. So like a spherometer to measure the radius of curvature, um, uh, calipers to measure the center thickness. Um, and then of course, when, when the lens is ass assembled, you know, you you take a picture with it and 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 see what the you know the proof is in the pudding. So you you see what the performance is. So so it's just basic testing versions of what's what happens today. Um, as far as testing goes, not necessarily for photographic lenses like this, but for precision uh, telescopes like the Hubble telescope. You know, obviously use advanced techniques that wouldn't have been available a hundred years ago. But for, as far as testing this, you know, physically measuring the radius of curvature and the thicknesses and, and the surface quality and stuff, it's, it's still the same. Wow. So it, and, and when you're polishing out a lens, say you're, you're trying to dial in this raised curvature number, uh, you're doing that when you're grinding the lens and and you sort of creep up on it slowly, so it's it's easy to hit a no, a radius of curvature. So like for forty one millimeters, um, commercial quality, th there's typically like a sort of a state of the art values that you can get, and then a precision value that it uses as a rule of thumb, and then then a, a commercial quality, which is a lower looser tolerance that that's easy to assemble or cheap to assemble i guess you could say and and for a raised curvature value like like this 42 millimeters i'm talking like a tenth of a millimeter or something like that um, mm. that's that's easily measurable and, it, and it's easy to sort of sneak up on as you're grinding out the surface and then once you get to a to a certain raised curvature which may be a, a little longer than this like 43 millimeters and you switch the polishing, then you'll you'll hit this pretty easily. So it's not it's it's precise. Let's make no mistake about that. But it's it's easy to hit that. It's relatively easy to hit sort of the level of precision that that they needed back in the day. And obviously, the re, the performance requirements weren't as tight when you're talking about imaging onto a, 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 a four by five or an eight by 10 negative that's going to be used as a contact print versus a, a digital sensor, right? which has a much higher sampling frequency. So this, uh, 
down here in the spot diagram, and I guess I should talk about that next. Um, I've got this sort of reference scale circle here that's 250 microns in diameter, and I picked that number because um, the that was sort of the the spot size that they shot for that Kodak sort of aimed for uh, when they were putting their Kodak brownies together. So that was sort of a 250 micron spot size was sort of a, the original requirement for maximum resolution for a Kodak Brownie. Um, you know, the old $1 box camera, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's only four. Think of that as four, four cycles across a millimeter, four line pairs per millimeter lines per millimeter. So pretty loose because it, you were just making little prints out of that. Now, as you got into the, you know, as time went on and, and, uh, like, like introduced the 35 millimeter format, obviously you're making an enlargement off of that. And the requirement for spot size or the circle of confusion or the blur diameter or blur circle, you know, went down. We're probably looking more at 25 or 10 microns. Um, and obviously for your, your digital sensors, it's even, it's even smaller where the, where the pixels for like the iPhone or, uh, or smartphones, uh, is like 1.1 or 2.2 microns. So, uh, but, but, uh, you know, I'm not making a lens that's, that's as big as a large format lens. I'm making a much smaller lens, which, you know, the lens scales sort of with the, the sampling frequency and, and it doesn't really necessarily become harder just everything becomes smaller so does that mean if you had a really good lens design for say 35 millimeter film mm -hmm. um that you or, or digital even you could scale that design up for large format but not the other way around well so you can scale them either way um uh, and let me see if i but your requirements would be much tighter for smaller formats, as you were well, saying. Well, so, I mean, obviously, you can't take a an iPhone lens and image any sort of usable um, image circle on a on an eight by ten, right? Mm -hmm. And so, what scales is is a focal. Actually, let me just show you. So I can scale this lens right now. It's a this EFFL value, that's the focal length. That's the actual focal length. Mm -hmm. And and here's the F number, 1.6. Uh, working F number. Uh, so I could, if I scale this to say like, uh, where is it? I can scale this to 150. All these numbers changed, right? Right. The scale of the spot changed. The prescription looks exactly the same, but that's okay because I'm still, it's kind of a bad example, but you know, the requirements for the, the, the blur diameter sort of end up scaling with the format that you uh -huh. use because you don't need, uh -huh. you don't need the resolution from a eight by 10 plate well i say plate because i make dry plates uh an 8 by 10 sheet of film to you don't need the resolution to make a nice 8 by 10 picture you just do a contact print and it looks really sharp and it blows everything else away um whereas if you're if you're scale if you're making a print from a 35 an 8 by 10 from a 35 millimeter uh format lens then then you then you need the the higher performance. Uh, but, but as far as scaling the lens goes, that happens every day for lens designers. Oh. So my database, in fact, when you, if you look through the databases and stuff, uh, my, my cat, one of my catalogs, well, most of them, and even lens designs in the patent literature, they'll all be scaled to a hundred millimeter focal length so that, so the designer like myself can compare the performance from design to design. If, if I pick a design, a hundred mil, one of these standard sort of designs as a starting point to, to make a new lens, I pretty much immediately scale it to the focal length that I need. 
and and uh. I do that at Cmax like this. You know, back in the day, you do that by hand, and you just let's see if I double the focal length, then I think all these numbers just double. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Right. That and, makes sense and, too, because that explains why some cell phones have like Tessar lenses in them. Yeah. So, and if I, and I rescaled this, so I doubled the focal length to a hundred. So I rescaled my, my reference, um, scale and the spot, spot diagram looks pretty much the same. Mm, gotcha, the one gotcha. thing that does change is the depth of field, the depth of focus. Right. Right. So if you, if you wanted to, in, increase the the, the resolution. The, 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 uh, why would you how would you achieve that, or could you achieve that? Because I mean, you you can achieve something on a very very small scale. Uh, so cell phone yeah. scale. Um, could you actually create a lens that will that will still give the same actual performance down to uh, down to a tiny amount? Uh, but well, for, but it's designed for a larger sensor. Well, that kind of gets into the crux of the lens design. You can do anything you want as long as you throw enough money at it. Uh, <laughs> and I and mean, the lens could be huge. Yeah, I mean, that that sort of gets into the requirements for the design. So um, it, it all comes down to performance. Uh like when I when I start a new design, I I say okay. Well, the first thing I need to know is what are the what are the performance requirements? What kind of MTF am I going to hit? And and as I've progressed in my career at 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 my day job, I've gotten into modeling the 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 system level imaging performance. And so so I'll take a customer requirements that they may need to see, like like a certain type of vehicle a certain distance away under certain atmospheric conditions. And I roll that into an imaging performance model. And the output of that is, um, you know, it's an iterative process, but the output is a, a minimum MTF that I need to hit. Um, I'll, you know, the, the, the team will, the design team, cause I don't work in a vacuum, the design team will select uh, a, a focal plane array. So, so a sensor um, and, and that information I use to generate the, the design requirements for the lens. Um, and it, the answer is usually not. In fact, it rarely is the best performance that you can get possible. It's usually what's good enough because you really, you know, if, if I design a lens that overperforms, then I'm just sort of throwing the cost of that extra performance away for no reason. I don't need it. So right. over time, you know, one of the key drivers uh, be, besides customers asking for, for sharper images, one of the key drivers of performance is what performance is good enough for the, for the sensor or film formats that they had at the time. So in the 19th century, when people were shooting wet plates or dry plates and making contact prints from them or, you know, for uh, making tintypes from them, you didn't need to enlarge the image. So you, this sort of resolution 250 microns was a good target. You know, if you could get your spots down under that size, then when you look at a, at a contact print or a tintype, you know, you, you can't tell, you can't see any blur. It looks, super, it looks way sharp as the film formats um, got smaller and, and the community, you know, photographers start making enlargements. The the requirements for for a smaller blur size go up, and 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 that's why over time, lenses got more complex. So I guess the other way to look at that is if if people were happy with the results from a landscape lens that was made and that was invented in what eighteen twelve or whatever, then we'd still be using those because they're cheap to make. And and that's the point about now with with modern optics and uh, the the more expensive yeah. lenses that have been introduced into the market over these last last few years. They've been talking about 
been super high resolution and so on. And the, yeah. that also goes with you look at the, the optical design of those lenses and they can be a prime lens yet it can have umpteen number of optical elements in there. So is it li literally a case you, you need more elements or is that just it's, one of the ways uh, that you get uh, high resolution? It's, it's uh, you can imagine that as a designer, I have a, a toolbox of different design techniques and and adding lenses is is one of them it's 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 the big one um because it adds variables you can sort of imagine this is going to be a terrible analogy but uh uh remember back in algebra when you'd solve solve an equation for a variable um if you had several variables to solve you needed an equation for each variable um to to get get what your variables are and lens design is sort of the similar way it's a multi-dimensional space where you're trying to find a solution to a problem and the more variables that you have at your disposal at, at your disposal the better you the closer you can get to a solution an optimal solution mm. and that sort of gets into the optimization of the design where <laughs> Is I'm that, totally uh, okay with I'm totally okay with that analogy. <laughs> okay, good. So, uh, so you can let me talk about the variables that I have for a design like this. I've got I've got all the surfaces. So you know, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, uh, thirteen, thirteen rays of curvatures that I can tweak. I've got all these thicknesses. I've got the glass types. And I've got the stop position and then back focus, right? That that solves that problem. Down here in this very simple merit function editor. So 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 this right here is the merit function editor. This is this is the constraints or the controls that I put on the design. So when when I run Optimax through its optimization technique, what it's doing is it's tweaking these values and adding up these contributions. And they all say zero because I didn't adding up these contributions and coming up with a merit function value. So it's it's like a root root squared. So it takes all these these present values and and I think squares them and sums them. So the smaller this merit function number, the better. Basically, is what it comes down to. And these are all constraints. And so the so if I have all these variables up here, which is uh, I can show you. I have, oh, it doesn't show it. Oh, 13 variables. The Vs are the numbers that I could vary. So I can, I can uh, define which, which uh, values I vary. So I have 13 values set, but I'm trying to hit 356. I'm trying to solve 356 equations with 13 variables. I'm not going to come to it to the exact solution for this. And, and you never do in a lens design. So I'm basically just finding the best answer to all these, if you can imagine, problems that I need to solve, that the design needs to solve. Um, and I will say that, uh, how many was it? 356 targets, I guess you could call them, is a very small number. So when I'm doing a formal, an actual design, I'm talking tens of thousands of targets and the variables, maybe 13 or whatever, that I'm trying to optimize. And it includes the focal length, um, which is this EFFL number. So at the second wave, which I look over my wavelengths, wavelength two is 587 nanometers. I want a, a target of 50 millimeters, let's just say 50. Um, this MM and CG. So these, these uh, four letter uh, words under type, these are what I call operands. So these are the constraints that I'm putting on the design. This MN CG is the minimum center value for the glass. So, you know, since I want this to be a real design, you know, I don't want thicknesses as as dmax optimizes i don't want it to try to pick negative thicknesses and i don't want to pick thicknesses that are under a certain value 
so 1.5 millimeter center thickness is about what optical shops are comfortable with trying to polish out. Um, MMCA minimum center air gap. You know, you don't want them crashing into each other. I've got it set at 0.14 millimeters, but up here, I so that scaling really screwed with this center thicknesses, minimi uh, a minimum value of a quarter of a millimeter. I don't like it closer than that. Uh, and then for the edge, the air, edge air, gra air gaps, so they don't crash into each other, and then edge glass. So, and then down here below this pink line, these are all um, operands that control the wavefront wave air. So the quality of the, the focus image and there's there's a ton of those because it's it's selecting um, you know it's picking up uh, uh, rays it's tracing rays through a bunch of different field positions um, across the clear aperture to get a good good sense of what uh, what's going on with the system um, so this entering these in usually I'll have tens of thousands of these. Uh, samples. Well, let's see. I like to pick these numbers, so I tend to have, um, you know, a few hundred for each field position and for each wavelength. And then up here above this pink line, I'll put in all the, I'll type in all the constraints that I need to put on the design to meet requirements. You know, manufacturing constraints, the focal length. Um, controlling how the rays are tracing through the system. Um, and that can run into the hundreds and thousands of constraints that I type in manually as I'm doing a design. So it, so obvious, I guess the, the, the short take is that uh, this can get complex really quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there, there's like a lot of data and information that I have to track. Um, you know, the mass, the mass of the system. Let's see. So it models mass properties all accurately. Uh, so this, the glass itself weighs 127 grams. Um, that's usually a constraint that I control because weight is king. I've always got the mechanical engineers for the system I'm working at wanting to push the weight down. So I try to make that as small as possible. Um, if, and I guess, uh, so I guess you could say that I'm a guiding hand. What ZMAX brings is, is the ability to crunch all this data and present it in a form that I can use and also run through all the optimization routines, which is, which is what most of the time a hundred years ago, a designer would require is, is doing the ray trace calculations. And, and at the time, before the before computers came into use, these might be the only two rays that they would trace through the system. And and tweaking, imagine tweaking each of these a little bit. You know, is forty one point nine seven two nine the best radius? Maybe not. So I might tweak that up to forty forty one point eight. And then calculate by hand what the rays are going through and trace it and seeing what the spot looks like. Yeah, see, made an improvement there. I, mean, um, I was going to say, what, what's interesting here, though, is that you've got a com computer-aided design, but it's not computer design. Because no, I, absolutely I, not. Yeah, because I've always thought that, well, computers are out there now and they, they're doing all you know, so many things for the designer and the designer's just, just checking it almost and then it, it, it goes off. But it, there's still quite, well, there's a, there's a huge amount of the designer or team of designers input into the overall design and, and ultimately the look that a lens produces. Yeah, and that's that's a good point to bring up. So, so back in the day, uh, a designer most of his work would be tracing the rays through and making sure he actually traced trace through. And so like when Paul Rudolph did the original uh, double gauss, uh, the, the protar, I think, see, I'm not good with the, the formal names, but the double gauss, when he first came that out, you know, it took him many, many months, like a year to get, to get to this point 
that I did, you know, just last night. Um, the emphasis nowadays, since since computers have come onto the scene, is not necessarily generating the data that I need to evaluate the design. I mean, obviously, you know, I share that in common with Paul Rudolph. It's the focus has been more in setting up the design so that I get to the solution that I want. So, so steering the ship as opposed to being the whole crew. I don't yeah. know if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, even, even Petzl, when he designed his, his, uh, the, the Petzl lens, he did, he had a, he had a crew of artillery officers doing his calculations. So they were his computer. And then they'd bring him the results and he'd go, okay, well, tweak this. I'll tweak this raised curvature. I'll tweak this thickness. I'll adjust it. So guys, go off go off to do the calculations and I'll see you tomorrow. So that iteration has, has, is the, has the speeding up of that iteration has been the biggest uh, thing that the computers have brought to the table. So as opposed to uh, maybe a dozen calculations a day, I could do millions of ray trace calculations in every second. And so consequently, you know, that helps keep up with the, 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 uh, you know, providing the performance that the smaller sensors um, need, I guess mm-hmm. it kind of goes hand in hand. Well, I was going to say we've uh, when we were setting this episode out uh, about how long we were going to send up there, stay on each section. I, I think we were about five minutes into the plan now. I think. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So let me uh, let me speed up. No, so, I mean, I, I'm going to say that I mean, if if this show ends up being going into two parts, um, then then so be it because. I, yeah, what's what's happened so far has been absolutely fascinating, and you know, we haven't even got to the bit where we want to ask questions. <laughs> so um, I think I'll just, so just we, I'll just bear that in mind, really. So if we if we need to extend this, uh, then then we will we will do that. Yeah, no, I I can I can I I still got plenty of time. So uh, I guess now that I've sort of shown you around. Uh, at least you can sort of see what's going on in ZMAX a little bit. Um, oh, the other thing is um, here's some system parameters. So the aperture, interest pupil diameter, um, field angles I mentioned, the wavelengths that I optimize at. There's a bunch of stuff in here. So just keep that in mind. That's part of setting up a lens design as well. I thought it, it might be kind of cool to sort of step through the evolution of, yeah. of photographic lenses from starting with a, a plano convex lens through a landscape lens, which was sort of the first lens that was used extensively uh, when, you know, it, I think it came out when people were using the camera obscura to trace for paintings. So the first photographic lens through the evolution of, of photographic objectives in the 19th century. And that was sort of at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Uh, by that time, you had sort of the foundation designs of all modern lens designs today. And so you can sort of see if I, if I can do this right, you can sort of see, uh, see how correction of aberrations evolved over time. Um, as 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 designers sort of mm-hmm. face the challenges that photographers were asking them to solve. Um, real briefly, I guess the aberrations are, and I and I won't discuss them in detail because you can go look this stuff up on the internet. But the spherical aberration, it was just an on-axis aberration due to the fact that most most designs use spherical lenses. Um, uh, color correction, chromatic aberration, uh, lateral color, which is a change in color correction over the field, um, distortion, coma, astigmatism, field curvature, they're all related. Um, so those are sort of the basic aberrations that cause the most problems when you're trying to make a nice image. 
Uh, the reason nobody uses, well, I won't say nobody, but the reason most people don't use just a simple plano convex lens is that the correction is horrible. You've got massive field curvature here. Uh, you can see that in the diagram by the fact, you know, where these rays for the different field angles converge. That's sort of the plane of best focus or the surface of best focus. You remember, we're looking at a cutaway. Um, spherical aberration means that different rays that hit the lens at different heights focus to a slightly different point. So you can sort of see this if I zoom in where the rays that are coming from the fringe or from the edge, the marginal rays focuses at a different position than the, than the on-axis rays. Uh, coma is an offset. You can't see it here because the the spot diagrams are so massive because the correction is so bad. This is a stigmatism. This is a, the off-axis field angle where the focus is different in, or the, the diameter of spot is different in this direction, in the horizontal direction versus the vertical direction. That's classic astigmatism. There's a little bit of coma in there, but you can't see that. Coma, go look that up. I can't. I'm not very good at describing coma. It's an aberration. That's a pain in the butt. Uh, different design tools are, are methods are used to correct the aberrations differently. Um, spherical aberration can be corrected by changing the shape of the lens. So the landscape lens had a meniscus uh, shape to it because that better corrects spherical. I'm going to just start playing here. Um, coma is corrected by the distance from the uh, the stop. Um, and so real pretty quickly early on, uh, designers sort of realized that, that a plano convex, while it's easy to manufacture, isn't the best for uh, um, giving you pretty pictures, except just right on axis. Um, so what I've done here is, is just, uh, established a starting point for designing a landscape lens. You know, a landscape is separated from the stop, uh, uh, by a certain amount, uh, to, to help with coma correction. And then, uh, the, the, the lens is bent. I say bent. Um, to better correct spherical aberrations. So correcting those two ab aberrations and then, of course, adjusting for focus uh, helps you out quite a bit. So you can see that on axis, this, you sort of, I've sort of sacrificed on axis performance. I think I can make that a little bit better um, to get the off axis performance improved. So, Jason, could you theoretically... Um, just looking at what you were just showing us, could you theoretically have a really high performance or almost near perfect single element lens if your film plane or your sensor was curved? Uh, it would be better. So one of the... I, I've sort of come to the conclusion over my career that field curvature is is the one aberration that that drives the complexity more than the others. Uh, there are still limits because uh, the answer is no, but it's sort of because of detail, it's like you're usually imaging at different wavelengths. Uh, but if you had a single wavelength um, that you're focusing down just on axis, um, yes, you can do that in one element. Um, and that's, that's not... You know, there was that paper that came out last year talking about how um, spherical aberration was corrected. Absolutely. Um, that wasn't really as groundbreaking from a designer's perspective as, as you think, because um, uh, the, the lens in your compact disc player, if you remember that, uh, mm -hmm. was a single wavelength, single lens that focused it down to, the, to, a, to a single spot. Um, 
So I guess the answer is yes and no. Depends on what the, the application is. Mm. For single wavelength uh, purposes, yeah, you can get away with a single lens. Um, absolutely. Uh, but for, for photography, no. Um, there's limits to it. So you can see why the Kodak Brownie, though, was able to get away with using a single lens. Or, uh, And actually, I'm going to... add a couple of uh in the brownie they correct coma so i'm just going to set up an operand that will correct the coma drive it down to zero but they also um tune the position of the lens or tune tune the focus or the the prescription to correct field curvature uh tangential field curvature uh, so this correcting tangential field curvature sort of leads to a swirly bokeh look, which is more pleasing than correcting the sagittal. And so if I do that, let me refresh. If I do that, you can see I refresh these, and you can see that there's 10 waves of coma and 2.6 waves. Of, or I think that's uh, pretty bad. Uh, ways of, of field curvature. Um, but if I re-optimize, then it should correct those exclusively. Oh, wow. And you get... Uh, I want to change this a little bit. Okay, and then the shape of the element there has just changed quite dramatically. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you can see it drove coma down to zero and is corrected absolutely for the field curvature. Um, but I want to, I need to adjust this just a little bit. No. This worked great last night. Um, oh, this is where I go. And magic happens. <laughs> to our listeners, we're watching a lens getting designed in front of our eyes. <laughs> Months worth of work happening in seconds. Yeah. So, so you can see that field curvature is corrected. So by that, I mean it's the spot here off axis has a has a much smaller diameter in the in this direction uh, than in in the uh, sagittal direction. So, so uh, for this spot here that that I'm pointing at, the center of the film is sort of up, and so tangentially, which is tangential to a circle around the, it's it's well focused. Sagittally, it's not. Um, I think I can actually show a simulated scene. And sort of show oh. what that would look like. So for our audio listeners, um, Jason has just pulled up an actual photograph of a bunch of people in front of a building. And uh, and so this is simulating it with this le this single element lens. Yeah, so this is this this is a sort and it's low resolution. Um, this is sort of a standard picture that most Zmax users would would recognize. Um, but it's uh, here's the source image, and it aside from the low resolution, you know, it's it's just a a really nice sharp picture. Uh, this image simula simulation routine allows me to to essentially run that image through the through the lens and see what the result would look oh, like. Oh, that's cool. Right. So the edges have just gone to crap. The edges have gone to crap. You can see that there's there's a, a significant amount of distortion. Uh-huh. Um, but it's uh, this is what sort of simulates what you get with a Kodak Brownie. And I think for the... When I was going through my class, I, I had an actual Kodak Brownie at the time, so I could replicate the actual imagery that I had taken out in my front yard 
and said, okay, here's a simulated image, and it looks exactly like what the brownie would get, which was pretty cool. Oh, that's super you know, cool. Um, and, I mean, this is driven by physics, so this is pretty realistic. Um, of course, you have to set it up properly and all that good stuff. Uh, so if I actually corrected for Sagittal instead, let me uh, let me minimize that real quick. So I'm going to drive... I'm driving sagittal field curvature to zero, and and I'm and I've turned off the the constraint for tangential. So if I optimize this, uh, what else? So if I optimize this. Well, it goes to shit because it can't correct coma and sagittal at the same time, and you get a much blurrier image mm. out 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 at the edges. Oh, so okay. That, so, no, go, go ahead. No, well, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> jinx. Yeah, uh, no, no. Go ahead, and I'll jump in. So I was just going to say that's that's why um, you get the swirly bokeh. Um, because well, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> um, it, it ends up being more pleasing to the, it, it ends up making it easier for you to get what appears to be a sharper image um, with that swirly effect or more pleasing image I guess you could say sorry so it's tangential and sagittal field curvature which which direction is each referring to okay so tangential means if you take a uh if you draw a circle on your film plane and then you draw a line that's tangent to that circle, uh -huh. uh, that's tangential field curvature. So it's, it's, okay. it's correcting focus that way. And it, it basically means that. So, so you look at the, the, the uh, lens diagram here. Um, the, these the stack of rays going off to this off axis field point those are sagittal rays because they're they're sort of in line with the center of the lens um those focus differently to a different point than than if you took a stack of rays that were tangential um to to uh to this point if that makes sense um just because they're hitting just because the stack of rays that you're focusing are hitting the lens at different positions. And so uh -huh. that all sort of plays out to, to their, their correcting. And that's sort of, you can see that in this diagram where the field curvature, which shows field curvature for, for tangential, the solid lines and sagittal, um, the different colors in here are for the different wavelengths, but you can see that they focus differently as you go off axis, so zero degrees, 10 degrees, 20, 30. So they start to deviate. Now, um, like I said earlier, the biggest detriment to, to uh, field curvature seems to be one of the big drivers, if not the biggest driver of lens performance. So if I actually tried to correct for both, um, I was actually able to curve my image plane. I think that you would see, and I'm going to add um, these operands to sort of control the image quality. I think that you'll be able to see that. The field curvature improves quite a bit. Um, and the biggest driver now is the chromatic aberration because I've just got a single lens. Um, okay. As opposed to, uh, where's my spot diagram? As opposed to, it's trying to correct. Hold on a second. Let me turn these off. I'm just going to let the spots try to drive the zero for all the different field angles. So I get this, and I think if I let the 
film plane curve, you can see the value went down. The spots get smaller. And so, oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So the as Kodak, the original Kodak brownie had a had a flat film plane. Um, the Hawkeye brownies, I think, uh, ended up having a curved in, uh, film plane for just this specific reason. Oh. So the so the roll of film sort of wrapped around a curved image plane that was that was optimized just like just like this to get a little bit better color correction. Um, now. The landscape lens is the other, so it, it corrects coma and field curvature, uh, but it also corrects spherical aberration. And the way it does that is it is is the lenses stop down. So this this example is is at f11. So stopping down the aperture, basically controlling the height of the rays as they go through the lens is is uh is another way to control the aberrations especially spherical so uh if you recall um rays that that hit the top of the lens focus at a different uh position than than rays near the center and i think i could show that if i open it up to something crazy like a like an f4 you can kind of see that I've now sort of ruined the performance. So when when Kodak was making the the brownie, you know, they stopped it down to like something crazy, like f twenty two. Um, so that that was the other tool in their tool chest that they used to control the aberration. So, so right. between spherical aberration, coma, and the field curvature. You, you get some really nice imagery, better than what you sort of expect. Just just looking of, at that, how you've drawn it there, that's a, a, a single element lens and then the, the aperture is placed in front of the lens. Yes. Um, I mean, I've, I've got a lens that does exactly that. Um, yes. It's a Taylor Taylor Hobson uh, rapid view lens and it's for a half plate camera. And yes. it, so it's got a, a cylinder in front of the meniscus lens uh, with a, with an aperture, and it's a, I think it makes it effectively f twelve point five or something like that. Um, right. But back in the I think I don't know if it was the, whenever the pictorial uh, movement was happening. I think in the eighteen eighties something like that. I think um, mm -hmm. this particular lens. Um, oh, is it Sieglitz? Uh, I think Sieglitz was one of the. There was two two guys doing the. Uh, stuff in uh, North America, I think, and uh, and they they took the this this front cylinder off because it just unscrews, and they're effectively yes. using it wide open. And I believe by doing that, it then became a, an f six point five lens, something on those lines, and it it introduced almost like a dreamy look as opposed yes. to the more realistic look when perhaps I, I went, when it was used with that. Um, that cylinder with the aperture at the front. So, is, is that is, does that explain what I've just been looking at? Yeah. So, so they they achieve that effect by by taking off that constraint that controls spherical aberration. So that dreamy look that you see uh, from from lenses like that is is due uh, to s spherical aberration and 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 the a uh, color lack of color correction. So. I, I I just I just love it that you know even back in the the late eighteen hundreds there there were people playing with lenses that didn't didn't want them to be too sharp. I right, think that's just, just just wonderful. Right, that was a uh, yeah that was a popular look at the time, for sure. And and you can see that it was pretty easy to achieve that look. Um. So now so as you mentioned. Uh, uh, this was sort of a, a common lens, and I think it holds the record as the most produced lens in the world just because it found its way onto the Kodak Brownie. Uh, one more comment, I guess you could say, that I want to mention is that it's behind the aperture stop because this makes for a more compact system. You get the same correction if you put this out in front. Um, so, but, but Kodak put it in the back because it made the box smaller. So there's always those sort of physical considerations 
ergonomics and stuff that goes into the design of a lens that that you don't get out of just uh, designing in front of a desk like uh, like you would think. Uh, there's a lot of real world practicality that goes into it. Uh, but as time went on in the 19th century, I mean, you could see the shortcomings. Uh, one of the big ones is that you have this, while you correct the tangential field curvature, you don't correct the sagittal. So you've got very significant astigmatism, which detracts from the off-axis imagery. It's great for portraits, but not for landscapes. Um, and also the, the lens is really slow. So during the night, and then, and then on top of that is also the lack of color correction off axis. So, um, and distortion was, was uncorrected as well. So there's a lot of issues obviously with this as, as time went on and, and photographers demanded sharper imagery. Um, so I was I was going to sort of step to the evolution of this landscape lens into the double gauss. Um, I, I'm, I'm just going to say, I, I think just, just looking at on the, the time side of things, I think we, we, we definitely need to, to split this up because um, I, I really don't want to rush some of the areas that we want to talk about later when we, when we talk about some specific lens designs and things. Right. So I think um, we should aim to uh, do the do the, the run through of the of the histories and how lenses became um, more more complex and things like that and I think once we get to the end of that section and to the part where we were going to talk about some of the specifics specific lenses we want to talk about I think at that point let us know when that is and I think we'll just we'll bring part one of episode 100 to an end I think okay that that sounds good yeah, uh, it's there's a lot of stuff to go through. Obviously, there's a lot to it. Um, the uh, I'll, I'll try to speed things up here because I saved. I did this exercise last night before the podcast, and uh, and so I sort of just saved discrete points that I want to stop and, and talk. So here, I've taken the landscape lens and I've added this sort of thick element to the, in front of the stop, and it's a flint. The landscape lens is a crown. Um, this is adding this thick lens is one of the basic tools for correcting astigmatism. And you can see here the effect. Um, yeah, I, I've removed the specific correction of coma and field curvature so I could drive the astigmatism down. And this lens here has no power. Um, this variable here, element power is zero. So it's not doing any of the focusing that's still this landscape lens back here uh it's it's basically just redirecting the rays into this lens so that i can get a, a stigmatic correction and reduce the the uh field curvature and i think in the the landscape lens the scale for this field curvature was more like 20 millimeters and so um that, that's better corrected or differently corrected, I guess you could say. Um, you'll notice also that the shape of this lens has changed. So those two things help better correct. Well, the shape of this mini meniscus helps correct spherical aberration. The shape of this lens combined with this thick element helps get at trying to fix the astigmatism problem. So um, Jason, can I ask a quick question here? Yeah. Um, yes. It's 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 slightly tangential, but one of the things that really interests me about um, the way you're talking about all of this yes. is partly your use of the the term prescription, um, yes. which you know, as someone who wears glasses, I think you do too. Is obviously the same kind of you know uh, optical lineage there. Um, yes. When it comes to astigmatism, uh, I have astigmatism, and you know, when I get corrective glasses for astigmatism, it seems like they just adjust the thickness of the lens um, among other variables. Yes. And is, is that sort of eye astigmatism exactly the same kind of aberration we're talking about here? So astigmatism in this case is, it is um, how the, the rays are focused, uh, you know, the tangential and sagittal 
rays are focused differently. So if you have a difference in, uh, if you remember my uh, explanation of the difference between sagittal rays and, and tangential rays, mm -hmm. um, they, if you have a lens that has where they come to focus at a different uh, distance, then that's that's the definition of optical astigmatism. And it's related to the Petzl field curvature. I mean, that is field curvature. Uh, astigmatism for the eyes is sort of similar but different in that um, you have uh, it's more of a user perspective where where um, a, a, a point is focused to a to an oval or a, or an elliptical yeah. shape as opposed to but focus different in the x and y direction so they're they're kind of related in in the way i look at it um where uh, a sagittal focus is focused in the vertical direction and tangential focus is well sagittal focus is is yeah um focused in a in a different direction than the tangential rays so, you know um but for optical astigmatism it's an off-axis aberration on axis is called spherical aberration and they're differentiated because they're different aspects of the lens um you know they they derive from different aspects of the lens um but astigmatism from my perspective is is off axis and i guess the prescription just to, to touch on it is is basically all these values so this this um, lens data data sheet shows the prescription. When you, so when you go out into the patent lens literature, you'll see a prescription that has radius, curvature, thicknesses, the distance, and all that good stuff. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay. So getting back to this, this was an improvement. Uh, this sort of layout. I mean, it's a basic two lens layout, but you could imagine starting to correct for color by making this an achromat. You could also make this an achromat, um, but keeping the power, and, and you could flip this around if you wanted your objective lens out front and this in the back. Um, that This sort of layout, basic layout, you could take this and you could evolve that into like uh, the, uh, the, the, um, what what was it the the sonar lens sort of design is sort of related to a cook triplet a little bit for for the purposes here what i'm going to do is i'm going to take this configuration and i'm going to cop flip fl copy it and flip it and and make a symmetrical design so you uh, earlier in the podcast, I mentioned that the double Gauss is a double is a symmetrical design. I want to take advantage of that to correct the distortion, which is still bad, and the coma. So coma sort of leads to this nose or comet looking shape where it's it's not focused perfectly around. It's it sort of has this teardrop shape to it. That's that's coma being uncorrected. And uh, design symmetry gets out of that. It also will help correct this lateral lateral color. The on-axis color correction can be fixed by by making this a doublet. So I did that, and um, came up with. So I basically just mirrored that lens and uh, split split the thick lens here into a doublet, uh, SK16 and F9. So that's a crown and a flint. Um, uh. This is still the same landscape lens back there. I mirrored that. It, it looks different because uh, because I need to resize it to capture all the rays, right? So, but it's still the same rays of curvature uh, as as before. Um, so now I have a buried surface here, uh, which helps. Um, that 20 millimeter gap 
between there. I, I that was intentionally there to leave enough room for for flipping it. Um, so fifteen, sixteen. I cut this down just because I know that it's going to want to do that. So you can see that it's pretty crappy here, but I'm going to hit the optimize button. Um, I've added. Oh, the other thing I did was since I doubled the optical power, um, I cut the focal length in half, but the stop diameter, this number um, in the podcast, you can go back and rewind. This number is still the same, but it's 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 gone from an F11 to an F56. So I've increased the speed and, uh, and pulled this in. Um, pulled in a performance so similar spots as before spot sizes as before uh but at uh i've gotten two stops worth of speed increase so that's what the double gauss sort of did at the end of the 19th century was correct the color you can see that the color correction is better um it's not quite there uh and i'll get to that in a minute but um it definitely increased the speed of the lenses, which everybody was sort of looking for at the end of the, at, for, at the same level of performance at the mm. end of the, the 1800s. Now, um, if I do this right, so this is a symmetrical design. This is pure symmetrical. So all these raised curvature and thicknesses, va thickness values are mirrored, but it's not a symmetrical layout because my object distance is still very far out there and it's short. So if I was making a telecentric lens, this would be perfect. This would be all I need and you get like perfect performance, but I have to accommodate that. So I'm going to let these change. Uh, I want to keep that one so that it doesn't go crazy, but I'm going to let the others change and and you can see that uh, this little number, this is what I'm looking at, the current merit function value. So what it's doing during this optimization routine is it's tweaking these values just ever so slightly and then recalculating the merit function to see if there's an improvement. And if there's an improvement, then the number goes down and it saves that and then it tweaks something else. So that's what it's doing there iteratively. And you can see that the performance has been improved just from that, even though yeah. it, symmetrically it's still it's still correcting the aberrations, leveraging design symmetry, but obviously the lenses are a little bit different. Um, and so, uh, and then I can actually get even more performance if I let the achromats fully color correct. So I just arbitrarily put these thicknesses in there but they're not the thick best thicknesses to balance the color correction you can see there's a little bit of difference in color correction well that, that's that's so crazy because it to my eye i mean the double gauss um design here when you've changed the variables the optical layout looks more or less the same but the performance on the spot diagrams is like dramatically better yes um, I mean, yeah. like, so, so, yeah, I mean, from center to, I guess, I guess the edge, right? Right. Yeah. Wow. So it's just tweaking and stuff. And so this is what um, designers would have been doing back in the day. Now I can do it kind of real time. Um, well, that also explains why, you know, uh, <laughs> among all the double gauss lenses that are available out there, the you know, most of them are pretty good, but the performance can vary dramatically. Yes. Even if the uh, even they, if the optical layout looks pretty much the same. Yeah, exactly. And and the other key takeaway is that they all get at the aberrations using sort of the same principles where I still have my thick lens here helping to uh -huh. correct astigmatism. The lens shapes are helping to focus. I have more variables so I could get get more better improvement. Um, and let me, uh, and then also, I don't want to shoot this at five, six, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make it faster so you can open it up and get better performance improvement. Let me tweak this. Oh, 
hold on a second here. Now you can see that the performance has decreased. So the other final tool in the double gauss bucket is to introduce intentional vignetting. Um, the, the lack of correction here is, so I've increased the speed to f2.8. So this is a 2.8 lens. So that's pretty uh -huh. respectable, right? Um, and obviously the spots have, have blown up. So I'm going to fix that using the classic double gauss so the, while you're doing this, the, the cone that suddenly appeared on the, the edge spot that's yes. shooting upwards, um, the really narrow cone, is that shooting towards the center of the frame? Yes. So the, the up is towards the center of the frame. Um, I, I wish they could lay out their spot diagrams a little bit better. I can actually look at um, uh, the full field spot diagram. No, it's it's just really cool when you but do this doesn't... because I... Because really I, I see, you much. I, I see that edge spot, and I think I have lenses that do that. To, yeah, <laughs> to light sources on the edge, and it really sucks. Yeah. So um, the other thing that double gauss designs sort of share is that they start they cut down on these these edge rays to help the improvement, and you can see as I vignette rays that sort of feature that was shooting out towards the center of the lens has, has been blocked off. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I brought it down. So this is kind of a extreme vignetting, but uh, this is this is how they correct them back in the day to get the better performance. So the vignetting is deliberately introduced to the, hide some the, of these edge aberrations? Absolutely. And so let me uh, just retweak this and and since the performance is so good, I'm just going to start correcting the wavefront instead of spots. Oh, that's so cool! Um, and let me uh, let me let my crew of artillery officers recalculate the rays, and you should see the performance opening up. Now, uh, keep in mind this is f at f two point eight as opposed to f eleven. Um, Whoa. Right, so I'm going to keep this open a little bit because I need room for my real iris. So, oh, and uh, now that I've set my vignetting, now in a, in a in a real design, as I'm working on this, when I got to the final point, I would work with the mechanical engineers to set real mechanical apertures to control the vignetting. So so this might have a lens seat that comes up to this point where my mouse is um, to to vignette, you know, in the back and in the front. I mean, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. I mean, the, the, the times when you see uh, tests done on lenses and you'll see vignetting when it's wide open and then it, as it closes down, it, 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 go, it goes away. And you're, you're there thinking, well, why, why couldn't they have just made it not vignette? Surely they could manage it. But now you can actually understand the reason why. And it, it's, again, it's coming down to that that criteria about the lens being good enough. And to to have dealt with the vignetting issue would have would have meant a more expensive, would uh, well, certainly more time in development and, and potentially more time in... Um, more materials, high quality materials, and so on, to make it mm -hmm. un uneconomic. Right. So, so they said, yeah, live with the vignetting, deal with it. So let me pull the, the right one here. Oh, I totally took my layout to, to ship, but uh, so this is this was the result last last night when I was tweaking this when I wasn't under real time pressure, but uh, you can see how. This is your classic double gauss, and you can see how it derived from from the uh, from the landscape lens. So that's 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 what the nineteenth century got you. Um, that's amazing, because I mean, just, so, just those two lenses are so different. It, it's I don't know. It just it's fascinating to see how you can actually go from one to the other. Yeah, 
Wow. So, it, but you can still identify the the original features. So there's your these outer lenses. So now you know in a double gauss, these outer lenses are the are the um, the imaging lenses. The doublets on the inside usually have very little power. They're providing the the correction of the astigmatism, and the symmetry itself is correcting the distortion. See here, here's this distortion plot field curvature distortion plot, and you can see that the distortion is less than half a percent, um, where it was like 5% before. And uh, so, yeah, there you go. Now, and then obviously, of course, it's not a, it's not a stretch to see how it could go from that to, uh, to, uh, you know, your Zwicko 50. So to get the get the faster speed, they uh, they split that last lens to provide more of those variables I I mentioned earlier, and they split this first doublet. Um, they also updated the glass types, of course. So during the 20th century, these lenses evolved as more um, glass types that were more desirable from a design standpoint became available. You know, the big the big leap was. Um, in the in the fifties, when when Shot came out with their lanthanide glasses that Leica use, or lights used to design the Summicron in the in the sonars and stuff, um, because they had a higher index, lower dispersion. So high higher index helps control how curved this lens is, and it helps control which which allows. Um, the angles at which these rays hit the surfaces to be not as not as extreme, like like this red ray here hits this surface at a at a pretty acute angle. There, um, that if it doesn't hit a, a surface as a, it at a, at as steep of an angle, then it helps loosen up your tolerances in manufacturing and assembly. Um, so the, the incremental advantage advances that took place during the 20th century, you know, just made these designs more robust, but obviously a double gauss can, can go really, really fast. Right. And, but you can see where it came from now, hopefully. Um, Jason, I, that's, it's, it's been fascinating. And I think this is a good place to, to end things. I think we've been going close to two hours now. So I'm just, just uh, thinking about those people who are going to be watching this on, on, uh, on YouTube and so on. So um, uh, we have got so much more to talk to talk about. Uh, we haven't, we've hardly scratched the surface of, you know, we, you know, Sonars, Helios and uh, all the other um, Tessars and, and, and so on. So I think we need to, we definitely need to do a part two. Um, so are you, are you up for coming back sometime? Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll sign up for it like I did last time. Yeah, sure, <laughs> yeah. I'll come back. And then when you get a hold of me, I'll be like, what did I sign up for? Yeah. Well, we'll <laughs> we, I think we're going to make this happen sooner rather than later. Um, yeah, we as, won't as, wait till 200. No, no, I, I think it will be, uh, with, you know, as soon as we can possibly make this, I, I think we need to carry this the, the, this on. Um, and uh, I'm just going to say, you just brought up, I think this is it's a good time to just talk about what's appearing on the screen at the moment oh. uh, before we disappear. Uh, Hold on, I'll stop fiddling. I'll bring it back up. Yeah. Uh, that was, uh, this is a lens from 2016. Uh, that's sort of where I, I, I finished this, doing the design work for this lens. This was, you know, we talk up, we sort of walked up to the end of the 19th century, but the, at the end of the 20th, beginning of the 21st century, these are the type of lenses that, that I'm dealing with. So this was a high, this is a high performance lens, not for the co commercial market. It's, it's an, it's a, it's a lens that's going up in space. Um, but you can sort of see from the MTF here, uh, that it's a very high performer. And obviously on this one, I kind of had to pull out all the stops. So this is a lens that I designed, um, uh, has several triplets and doublets and, and, uh, it was sort of a unique lens in what needed to be corrected. Um, is it a zoom lens? 
No, this was a this is a fixed focus lens that had to have very high performance correction over over a a, a wide image range. Um, so this is like a front window. The focus group was these three lenses here. This is a triplet, doublet, and a singlet. So these are the only lenses that move for focus. Um, but the requirements just, I think that's this started out as a double gauss that just got uh, more complex as I needed more design variables. Um, so it started off as double gauss. I mean, would that, how it is at this moment, does it, would it even have? Oh, uh, it's nothing like that. Yeah. <laughs> it, it went into a whole new realm, but that's kind of, you know, as I work on a lens design, and this took several months. So as I work on a lens design, you know, it'll it'll evolve and change. Um, and these are kind of what the spots look like. And you can see the this RMS radius. This is the radius, you know, half diameter of of what the actual spots are. And and it had to be that tight because of the the size of the imager and, and the pixel pitch and stuff that it needed to image onto. This was a pain in the ass. Or pain in the rear. I'm sorry, I forgot. I'm not supposed to swear. Um, but I mean, this is an actual lens that, that I then worked with a mechanical engineer to to wrap a barrel around it and, uh, you know, went through reviews and stuff and, and was produced. Prototypes were made and tested and and it went into production, uh, and the customer was pretty happy with it. Um, it's more expensive than a consumer lens, of course. Yeah. So, so they would come to you with a spec on like size and performance and price, and you would they, sort of. No, the usually what happens is is I'll get a, a statement of work, or a, a specification document, and it's. Um, rarely specifying the lens itself um as a former customer myself i you know i didn't want to fall into the trap of telling the 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 designer how to what to design but i you know instead telling them what i needed uh, um, so not so how to design use but for. what to design so so when it's specified you know, there is a out of their imaging system performance analysis. They spit out uh, uh, MTF values, and it was like two points along the curve at different spatial frequencies. Uh, and they had requirements like uh, you know, it needed that performance over a range of focus distances, and um, you know, distortion had to be controlled to a, a certain amount. And, um, and then, you know, the, 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 the stray light had to be controlled. So they, they would call out, um, um, veiling glare. There was a veiling glare requirement, which is sort of a measure of contrast, I guess you could say. And then, then all the environmental parameters. So it's got to work over temperature and it's got to work in, in different environments and look and uh and all that good stuff so there's a lot to it but the the specifications itself like even i said okay well based on your selection of a focal plane array you know here's the focal length that you'll need so i would i would take their requirements and drive them down to a design specification so this is designed to be used stuff. in space yes um quick question then you know the the spaces between elements um the air elements uh, does the does the sort of content of that space make a difference? You know, if you're in space, there's no air, right? So I'm yes. thinking, you know, if if it's in space where there's no air, or if it's I don't know, clean air versus polluted air, or like I don't know, tear gas. Well, it's it's a vacuum, so uh, the pressure is zero, and then but, uh, so is that 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 must be a variable that you're controlling for? So I I specify it so. Uh, and the way I specify it is this pressure. If you can see me pointing at it down in yeah, this yeah. Uh, system. Yeah. So zero pressure means 
for ZMAX, that that means vacuum. So it it models the gaps between there as as a vacuum. Um, so would all would consumer lenses just use a, a generally assumed like constant for these, or would you have some lenses that are designed for I don't know high altitude shooting on Mount Everest or something? Well, so or a low temperatures in the Soviet Union. So going into this, uh, so going into this, um, this design, I sort of had the same cl- uh, questions because one of the questions was, okay, when you get the prototypes and you test them, is it going to be representative of, of the performance up in space? And what I found early on and it's something that I had to play around with and, uh, was that really it just boils down to a change in focus. You get a focus shift. And so if you were to take your, oh. your Soviet lens, you know, from Siberia up into space and you want to take a picture, you just refocus. Oh, okay. So I was like, well, that's good. So you guys would be able to test, test this in a lab without uh, setting up some complex vacuum system to put it in. Which I think they did it anyways, but uh, but yeah, it just translated into a shift of focus, which was nice. Right. Okay, well let's 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 bring this to an end. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, I mean, we we enjoyed it the first time round when it was just uh, Carl and Johnny uh, before the actual recording. Um, we've got into far more detail this time and. I think uh, some of the questions that, were, that have come up, we didn't expect to be asking. Um, so it's uh, it's it's been really really interesting. So uh, we we want to continue this, so we can see more evolution of lenses and, as I say, talk about some some specifics. But that's going to be for a, for another time. Um, so I think um, well, a couple of things. One, we're not going to do any emails this week. We have actually got a few. So those people that have sent emails in, we will do those on a on another show uh, soon enough. Uh, so bear with us on that one. Um, and uh, I think what we could do is uh, some shout outs because we've got a little bit of time for that. I don't know if uh, you've got any, Jason. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm still good. I'm good. Go ahead. No, no, that's for you. <laughs> oh, that's for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, shout out to um, to the uh, to the high schoolers and and the the engineer that's helping me on Pictoria Graphica to help grow the business. As that company grows, um, it's pretty exciting to 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 see um, all the support out in the community. So, shout out to everybody else who who's taken interest in dry plates and and tried out the the plates and stuff i it's it's great i get a lot of in, enjoyment out of that so um and to my wife for putting up with me that's great and uh perry have you got any shout outs this week uh do i have any shout outs this week i don't think so no okay uh johnny uh no not specifically this week i just want to thank everybody you know, again, who's who's participated on these past 100 podcasts and everybody who has uh, sent questions and listened and just been a part of it. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, I second that. And uh, uh, I've just got uh, I'll just do one shout out and that's going to be uh, to Ethan Moses, who has uh, um, his project for the Branco Pan camera has been funded. So that's definitely Hooray. awesome. So, it's cool. So uh, well, well done, Ethan. And uh, so those the 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 STL plans for three D printing the Branco pan cameras will be be happening within weeks, no doubt. Uh, so that's 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 great news because I'm look, really looking forward to getting it started on mine. Um, Since I've got this fifty millimeter uh, lens that is going to be great on it, I'm sure. Um, Okay, Uh, other things, um, because I can't access my screen in the way I I normally like to do, uh, I can't do the coffee uh, donations this week, Um, but thank you uh, those people that have uh, donated to to us on the show. Um, If you want to help support the the podcast, uh, just go to coffee.com, that's K-O-F-I dot com and just search classic lenses podcast and you'll uh, you'll find our page there um 
and uh, that's just about it. So, uh, Jason, it's it's been fantastic uh, having you on the show again. Um, how can people keep up with the things that you do out, outside of this podcast? So, uh, a couple of ways. One, I have a newsletter uh, that you can sign up for on my website at pictoriographica.com. Um, I'm usually pretty active on Instagram at Pictoriographica. And then I'm also running the Dry Plate Photographers Group on Facebook. So those are kind of the the places that I that I post and post up stuff as as things move along. So okay, and your you, I mean I just just mentioned uh, the Branco Pan being uh, successfully funded on Kickstarter, and uh, oh. you you your project uh, was successfully funded last year. Now, um, uh, do yes, you have a, a bit of a progress update for for, for your backers? Yeah, so that was successfully funded, and, and thank you to all the supporters out there um, who uh, who backed it, and, and all the people who have wished that they had seen it in time. Um, that's all great. Uh, so we uh, we went through uh, uh, the the design of the holders with the mole manufacturer, and and got that uh, tweaked and squared away. So the manufacturer has been. Uh, cutting the molds, fabricating the molds for the injection molded parts. And uh, he's in the middle of doing that. I expect them to be done with those within the next week or two. Um, and then we'll we'll get them to start doing the production run of parts. Um, they'll, they'll make a few prototypes to make sure that they know how to assemble them. Uh, we'll review those. That'll happen in the February, early February timeframe probably. Uh, and they'll run the parts in, in February and we'll distribute them at the end of February, early March. So we got a little bit of a schedule slip, but not not bad. I'm expecting people to get their holders in March. Yeah, well, certainly uh, those those people that have been uh, the back, backed uh, the Pixelator uh, from Hamish Gill will, will know that <laughs> things get pretty difficult when you get to the injection molding stage. So uh, hopefully you'll you'll have more luck than Hamish did. Yeah, we've we've had it reviewed. We worked with the manufacturer and stuff, and and uh, um, the mechanical engineer Max, who is helping me now, he's he has experience with injection molded design. So, um, but uh, you know, it, yeah. the proof will be in the pudding. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, fing fingers crossed on on that one. And uh, thank you for that. So, uh, uh, Perry, how can people keep up with you outside of this show? You can find me on Instagram uh, and Flickr at PerryG or go to my never updated website at PerryG.com. I'm currently uh, struggling through now, you know, ever since Johnny mentioned how he manages his Instagram in groups of three, um, <laughs> I've been struggling <laughs> with sort of subconsciously forcing myself to do that as well. But recently I've been shooting with a whole bunch of random weird formats like the Horizon 202, and I just went out with my rolly cord. I'm like, oh man, I don't have three images from these that I want to put together. So, <laughs> why do you, you think I haven't posted on Instagram in a year? <laughs> yeah, bad. damn you, Johnny. <laughs> okay, well, uh, how about how about you, Johnny? The uh, best place to catch up with me is at Central Camera Company in Chicago. I'm there uh, every day except for Monday when I'm here doing the podcast. That's cool. And uh, how about? So how about ways of people uh, that can get in touch with us on the podcast? Sure. Well, you may be listening to this right now on uh, listening slash watching on YouTube. So um, you've already found us if you're there, but you can find us on YouTube by looking for searching for Classic Lenses Podcast. Um, the podcast website is classiclensespodcast.com, and you can send us an email at classic lenses podcast at gmail.com. Uh, and also be sure if you're there looking around on uh, Instagram, take a look at, uh, at Perry's stuff, check out best vintage lens on Instagram. Uh, they are our Instagram partner and they have amazing images made by vintage lenses posted every day of the week. So check that out for sure, as well as Ricardo's show notes while you're there. That's it. And if, any, if anybody wants to have an official tasty beverage of the Classic Lenses podcast, where should they look? They probably shouldn't look for any Malort. <laughs> uh, we are sponsored, not sponsored, 
by Malort, Chicago's finest nasty beverage. <laughs> um, and then finally for me, um, you can follow me on Instagram as Simon Forster Photographic. I'm on Twitter as Simon Four. And uh, I think that's just about it. We've, we're present in two Facebook groups as Photography with Classic Lenses. And there is also uh, our main podcast group, which is uh, Classic Lenses Podcast uh, Facebook group on Facebook. Uh, the music for the show is by uh, Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com and it's called Octo Blues. And that's it. So I hope you've enjoyed this week's show it's been uh, a little bit different from from normal and um so if you can be like carl <laughs>